Hi, it's your pal Steamed Hams. Join me every week on the Unforgettable Luncheon as we discuss topics in the nerd world like gaming, comics, cartoons, and whatever else may cross my mind. You can find me on the socials as SteamedHams81 on Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram, and YouTube. You can also find me as the Unforgettable Luncheon on Facebook. And check out Steamed Hams Merchatorium, the link to which will be in the description of this podcast. The Unforgettable Luncheon, nerd comedy at its okayest. Movies. For 90 minutes, you can escape into a fantasy world where you get to watch the hero win, the bad guy get his comeuppance, and everyone walks off into the sunset. Well, what if you could do more than watch? You could be part of the action, or part of a loosely based story with the same characters. Today, we're talking about games based on movies. Hello, it's your old pal, Steamed Hams. I hope you're ready for another unforgettable luncheon. We're going to talk today about movies that have video game adaptations to them. So we're going to go through some eras, you know, the Atari, Nintendo, Super Nintendo era, and kind of talk about these games, how they did differ from the movies or how they stayed the same. So let's dive right into the action with the Atari 2600 and its most infamous entry, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Based on a 1982 movie about an alien that was accidentally abandoned on Earth and must enlist the help of a 10-year-old boy in order to return home, while of course avoiding the U.S. government and its need to capture him, study him, dissect him, and basically make him not alive. It was easily the most notorious game that we're going to talk about in this episode. It was made in a rushed five-week production schedule. Uh, Atari games back then took anywhere from two, two to six months to produce. Uh, the object was to collect three pieces of a telephone to phone home, of course, avoiding the feds, plagued by terrible control and gameplay. You had all these holes around while you were trying to search for these phone parts and avoid the, the guys in the trench coats. You even came within an inch on the screen of one of these holes you fell in. You had to climb out, and then sometimes you, as soon as you climbed out, it triggered it going back into the hole again and again and again. Now, I did not play this as a child, which had I, I might not be a video game lover because this might have turned me off. I actually dated a girl many, many, many moons ago who had an emulator that had this game on it, and she got to watch me invent brand spanking new swear words. Oh, it was fun. No, it wasn't. Uh, Again, one of the worst games ever made, and it was a big factor in the great video game crash of 1983, where the home video game industry kind of took a shit for a couple years until the gaming gods blessed us with the Nintendo Entertainment System. And this was always an urban legend that all the unsold and returned cartridges were buried in a landfill in New Mexico, but that wasn't proven true until about maybe... Eight years ago with a couple of documentaries and a comedy film called uh, Angry Video Game Nerd, the movie, which I highly recommend seeing because Angry Video Game Nerd is one of my favorite things to watch on YouTube. Now we're going to go to a movie that had slightly more success in in terms of the game, but not as good. Uh, We're going to talk about Porky's from 1983. Based on a 1981 film about a group of boys in 1954 in Florida looking to lose their virginity. Gee, I wonder where American Pie got their plot from. The boys go to a strip club in the swamp called Porky's, only to be humiliated by the owner and, of course, swindled out of their money by him and his brother, who happened to be the sheriff. Uh, The game involves a few different play types, Now, the movie involved them wanting to get revenge on Porky's, just like in the game. But the game starts out with you in a trap under Porky's, where you have to collect pieces to a ladder by pole vaulting to them, collecting them, and then you climb up to the next part. Now, if at any time you fail, get caught, something like that, you get dropped back in this trap, but you don't have to keep rebuilding the ladder. You just have to pole vault up to it, hope to God you don't get caught by the sheriff. Uh, Then you go into the ladies' locker room shower, which was 
one of the most famous scenes in the movie where they were peeping on the girls and uh, the girl's coach, Miss Ballbricker, who you have to avoid in the game, sees one of the guys sticking his uh, unit through the hole in the wall they were peeping in. She grabbed it, tried to basically rip it off, and spends the rest of the movie trying to find this guy that did it. Um, and then basically what you got to do is you got to climb to the top of this level, drop these different little objects down to the hole into that bottom part um, that are going to build something to basically blow up Porky's and send it into the swamp. But anytime you come into the uh, eye, the eye line of the girl showering, that's when this ball bricker shows up and you have to run and hopefully not get caught because back down the trap you go. So you succeed in that and you have to do it more than a few times to get all the parts. Um, you go to a frogger leg level where you're basically crossing the highway and of course if you're hit, back down to the trap to lather, rinse, repeat. Then you get past that, you go uh, to try to climb some scaffolding which more or less is like an invisible map because the path changes every time. If you miss a step, you fall down. You're probably caught by Porky if you can't get back up in time. And back down the trap you go. Of course, if you make it all the way to the top and you have all these parts, you just jump on the plunger, destroy Porky's, and there, you win the game. It was a ton of trial and error. It was definitely not as good as the movie. Um, I might, I've never played it myself, but I might give it a shot if I ever come across it in, say, an emulator or something, because, you know, why not? Why not give it a shot? I might enjoy it. We're going to move on to the NES now, because any more of the movie properties I could talk about with the Atari weren't that great. I mean, you had Empire Strikes Back, it wasn't too wonderful. You had Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which more or less had you running around as Leatherface until you ran out of gas for your chainsaw. And playing a babysitter in Halloween with the music incessantly playing on there. Not not the most fun. It'll, it'll cause nightmares for you. We're going to head into the NES. And to be honest with the NES, the company that had the big movie property license was LJN. We could spend all day talking about how LJN fucked up so many movie licenses. But we won't. We'll maybe talk about one or two games. But first, we're going to get into Top Gun from 1987. Yes, I know we've discussed this game before with its atrocious landing uh, part. But, I mean, the game itself is not too bad. Now, here's the fun part. The game has almost nothing to do with the movie apart from flying in planes. You don't even officially play as Maverick or Goose or Wolfman or Iceman or... Merlin, or Jester, you know, you, the movie was more or less, if for those of you who haven't seen it, about Navy fighter pilots who go to a specialized combat school called Fighter Weapons School, a.k.a. Top Gun, it is a real uh, school with the U.S. Navy for aviators, uh, before being called on to un fight an unnamed, totally not the Soviets, enemy to deter World War III. In the game, you go through missions like a training mission to get your feet wet, um, sinking an aircraft carrier, destroying an enemy base, and a space shuttle, which none of which were in the movie. I mean, how the hell do you have a Top Gun game without having a shirtless volleyball minigame? I mean, that was an important part of the movie, right? Right? You know... This was not Top Gun in the sense that you flew a plane and you shot stuff down and you landed on a carrier. I mean, when you could land on a carrier, but that's about it. It was a decent game. It had its entertainment value. Um, it did have a sequel called The Second Mission, which we will talk about another time. I've never played The Second Mission, but I'd love to get my hands on it, give it a shot. I finally remembered Top Gun, and I wouldn't mind playing it again, uh, assuming I could ever get my hands on it. Now we're going to go into the LJN waters. I mean, we have to talk about at least one so you can get an idea. Uh, we're going to talk about Back to the Future from 1989. For those of you not born in the greatest decade in the world, the 80s, uh, it was a 1985 film about uh, Marty McFly, a teenager 
who accidentally go, takes the time machine back to 1955 and ends up having to help his parents meet after he fucks up their initial first meeting by kind of getting involved. And he has to work with the past version of the inventor of the time machine to get back to the future. Yeah, he said the thing in the movie, trust me. He said the thing. And now I said the thing. This game, once again, is loosely based on the movie. First level features Marty skateboarding and trying to collect clocks to keep himself and his siblings from fading out of existence. Because, for those of you who have not seen the movie, he has a picture of him and his brother and sister. And as he, as things are kind of screwing up where his parents may not fall in love, they all start fading out from existence from the picture because they were never born. And Marty's got to keep himself from fading out of existence because then that goes into some crazy grandfather paradox, time travel bullshit that... We're not going to get into today. Um, it has that music that just plays over and over again. Isn't a cover of anything. Isn't. It's just random music. And it sucks. It gets stuck in your head too. It's an earworm. And I hate it. Okay. The second level was a malt shop. Where you're trying to basically rebuff the advances of your teenage mother. Because yes. Instead of falling in love with George McFly, she falls in love with Marty McFly, a.k.a. Calvin Klein, which goes into some really weird territory, even for the 80s. I'm sorry, man, but that's just wrong. It's just wrong. Um, and you're basically throwing malts at these girls that are trying to come at you, which, you know, when girls like me, my first thought was, yes, I'm going to throw dairy products at them. I mean... My wife and I throw cheese at each other all the time, but it's usually cheese cubes, and we're catching them in our mouths. You know, I just wish, you know, I had better aim. I keep plopping her in the head. But, you know, we're adults, and we can do what we want, okay? And the third level is catching musical notes while playing at the dance, the Enchantment Under the Sea Dance, or as Marty's sister puts it, the Fish Under the Sea Dance. You know, the dance where his parents fell in love. And, of course, I think you have to avoid bullies or something. I've never made it to that level. I've only seen it in, like, playthroughs. So I'll be honest with you. <laughs> the final level features the DeLorean, which was the time machine, which was a really kind of cool car from the 80s. Um, obviously, it's not made anymore. If you see one on the road, it's like one of those. It's like that scene from uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood where you're doing the Leonardo DiCaprio point, and you're like, that's the thing. Um, you're trying to catch lightning bolts to build up to 1.21 gigawatts to activate the flux capacitor and get to 88 miles an hour and get back to the future. I said the thing again. Ha! I did it twice. So, we're going to move on to an actually decent port with um, Batman from 1989. And this is based on the uh, first Tim Burton Batman film, starring Michael Keaton as Bruce Wayne slash Batman and Jack Nicholson as the Joker. Um, if you've not seen this movie, I mean, come out from under that rock, check it out, see what a great movie it is. It is one of those movies that prove that superhero movies could be done well and marketable. I didn't see it as a kid. I didn't see it until I was probably in my early teens because it came out when I was about eight or nine, but I had no interest in it as a kid, but I saw it later, and I'm like, this is a good movie, and I continued to watch them for the most part. Um, it's, once again, loosely based on the film, but still closer to the film than the other games we've discussed in terms of it does feature a lot of the same set pieces that make sense. You have five levels here, so battling in the Gotham streets, going to the Axis Chemical Company, where, of course, the Joker originated at and of course a final battle with the joker at gotham cathedral uh it's a great game it does i mean a couple of the bosses are like low tier batman villains that weren't even in the movie and you got henchmen but i mean what are you gonna do it's a game it was made by sunsoft they made some pretty decent games um in the few in the past such as uh journey to Silius, which is uh, a fun game I discovered on the Switch, and uh, the Adams Family Fester's Quest, which I'll discuss in maybe another episode. Um, definitely a great game if you can find it through an emulator or if you actually have a Nintendo and find a copy of the cartridge. 
I say go for it. It's a ton of fun. Now we're going to head into the Super Nintendo era. Now this one's a bit odd here, but we're going to talk about Terminator 2, the arcade game for Super Nintendo. Yes, they actually ported the arcade game uh, from the Midway arcade game made in 1991 uh, to the Super Nintendo and to the Sega Genesis. And in my in my opinion, it is the superior T2 game that was made for any of the systems, be it the Nintendo, which I did like the Nintendo version, but it had its faults. Um, and the other Super Nintendo and Genesis T2 game was just fucking abysmal, <laughs> to say the least. This is a rail shooter. For those of you who don't know what a rail shooter is, it's basically the game is usually set up with a gun that's either mounted or a, a gun that's just connected by a cord. And you're led through kind of, it's almost like you're riding on a rail and you're moving through the level and it's like a shooting gallery type of thing. But they shoot back. And it starts in the future where you're trying to get to Skynet to defeat its central processor and to be able to send a Terminator back to, of course, protect John Connor as a kid. And then you come to some of the events of the film, such as the assault on Cyberdyne Systems and the steel mill battle with the T-1000. Now, I will admit, I made it further in the home port than I did the arcade, because back then, you had to spend quarters or tokens in the games, and, you know, those got expensive for a kid. So, and the Nintendo, you could continue as much as you want. You could replay over and over again. And, I mean, all it cost you was a rental unless you bought the game. But now I get to play it at the Galloping Ghost Arcade in Brookfield, Illinois. And it's fun because even though I try to do one credit and don't make it very far, I decided, you know what, I'm going to take a shot and I'm going to see as far as I can get. I think I did make it to Cyberdyne before, honestly, my hands start kind of cramping up a little bit because, strangely enough, I just cannot sustain an actual gunfight. And fun fact... I did actually on, you know, because you have to, to, in order to get world record scores or something like that, you have to do it in one credit, the score you can get in one credit. For a while, I did hold the th number three high score on this game in the world. Well, I'm assuming in the world. I never checked Twin Galaxies. I only know of Arcade, which is the other score tracking site that I get in. Um, I have my scores on. It's a fun game. Whether you play it on the Super Nintendo, maybe the Genesis, uh, you go to the arcade, or you get your hands on an arcade one-up of it, I highly recommend this game. I especially recommend it because it was made by Midway, which is based in Chicago, which means it's a locally made game, and I will always go for locally made games. So definitely give Terminator 2 a shot. If you've not seen Terminator 2, the movie, look... Spoiler alert for a 30-year-old movie. Schwarzenegger's the good guy this time. And he rescues the kid from... I think he was in Brain Scan, Pet Cemetery 2. And a good movie called Detroit Rock City. Which actually, don't don't get me started. It's a good movie. Shut up, it got me in a kiss, alright? Alright. Now I know we're skipping back to the Batman well because, you know... Batman, good Batman games are actually few and far between, believe it or not. And uh, we're going to talk about Batman Returns from 1993 for the Super Nintendo. This is based on the 1992 film that pits the Dark Knight against the Penguin and Catwoman. Once again, a Tim Burton film. And I mean, you watch it and you'll know it's a Tim Burton film, trust me. You don't even have to see the name of the credits. Um, it's a side-scrolling beat-em-up, much like Final Fight, Streets of Rage... You know, games like that. I used to, I love those games. Those games are fun. I don't know why, but I enjoy the hell out of those games. Um, this does much more follow, closely follow the plot of the movie, unlike the NES game. You know, you actually go through missions that follow the plot of the movie. You battle Red Triangle Circus Gang throughout seven levels, and you, you know, battle the, the Penguin's other uh, henchmen. And you, uh, it culminates in a battle with the Penguin in his cool little, whatever that was, that duck car thing, whatever. Now, I never actually finished the game. I've, again, seen it on playthroughs, uh, making it that far. But I enjoyed playing the game because, again, I like a good, solid beat-em-up game. 
And if I can ever get my hands on this again via emulator or actual copy, because I have a working Super Nintendo back at my parents' place, I'm going to give it a shot. I highly recommend you do too. A top tier game in my book. Finally, we're, we're going to go a bit Inception here with a game based on a movie, based on a game. Street Fighter the movie, The Game, from 1995. It was a you know, digitized fighter game based on the movie, you know, like Mortal Kombat, using actors on green screen. Um, it was digitized uh, likenesses of the actors from the game. So you got Van Damme in there, you got Kylie Minogue, you got Raul Jul- I think you got Raul Julia, or at least a body double for him. Because, unfortunately, he did pass away soon after the movie was filmed. And you can get some characters that were made specifically for the movie, like uh, Captain Sawada and a couple others. I mean, I've played this game, and while it's not a terrible game, I'm sorry, but the whole digitized people thing, Mortal Kombat did it better, and they did it with, like, less technology than Capcom had. (laughs) So, um, it's not bad, but... Not something I'm going to go out of my way to play if I happen to see it. I'll give it a shot, but um, it is notable for being the first time in the series that boss characters like Balrog, Vega, and Bison being referred to by their Western names versus their Japanese names. So that's pretty cool. Um, I, I gave it a shot. It wasn't my cup of tea, but, you know, it's worth a second, maybe third playthrough to see if I do truly enjoy it, you know? What what's the harm? I can find it at Galloping Ghost. They have like nine hundred plus games. And now, enough of uh, my complaining and bitching. We're gonna go on to this week's plug and play. For those of you, this is your first time here. Plug and play is where I plug a game or a business or artist of some sort that I enjoy and I would like to share with the world. This week's plug and play is a great new comic book shop, Hellfire Fire and Dice, located at 9990 Ridgeland Avenue in Chicago Ridge, Illinois. They are fine purveyors of comics, collectibles, and so much more. They have a dedicated tabletop gaming room in the back where you can set up games like Magic the Gathering, Cards Against Humanity, and of course, Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, what's a tabletop gaming room without at least one D&D campaign, you know? You can also uh, utilize their subscription service where you can subscribe to books, get a discount, and get other great deals at this place. The proprietors are good people, they're comic book nerds, and they're they're out there to share their love of comics with everybody else. You can find them on Facebook at HF Fire and Dice. The link will be in the episode description. And you know what? Tell them Steamed Ham sent you. Well, that's it for this week's Unforgettable Luncheon. I hope a good time was had by all. And I will see you folks next week, where we will be discussing something nerdy.